Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 27 of the Juvo Hub podcast, also on YouTube. And we are so grateful that you have tuned in and taken some time out of your day to be with us again today. Looking forward to an amazing show once again on a topic that is so important for our industry to hear and not just hear, but take action on. We're going to hear from a special guest from Radco Residential And she's going to discuss with us what Radco is doing on the topic of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So it's going to be a fabulous show. But before we introduce our guest, Mark Howell, my fabulous co-guest, co-host, what's happening, man? Thank you for being here. How you been? I've been great. And I'll be whatever you need me to be, Jonathan. I'm just (laughs) grateful to be here. (laughs) So whatever works. But yeah, thanks for having me. I'm very excited about this topic with Janet. I think it's it's obviously one that our industry, we need to have more uh, more conversations around. But wow, what an important time to really bring this up and, and make sure that everyone is doing something, you know, something different. So I'm so excited to be here. Yes, yes. So without further ado, Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Janet Belden from Radco Residential. She's the Vice President of Talent Management. Janet, welcome to the show. So happy to have you. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, Yeah, uh, so as you mentioned, Janet Belden, Vice President of Talent Management with Radco Residential. And I've been with Radco now for, gosh, seven and a half years, almost eight years. So really seeing the company go through uh, a lot of changes over the years, a lot of growth, um, and uh, it's been quite a ride. So I I come from a background in human resources, um, very drawn to anything people related, uh, anything where there's people, I'm there. Um, And I'm just super excited uh, and honored to have the opportunity to talk about this topic with you guys. And thank you, Jonathan, for being open to the topic as well. It's it's such an important one and uh, hard to kind of navigate the conversation. So I appreciate you and Mark really being willing to to have it, you know, here on Juba Hub. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for being here. So give us uh, an idea, like, so Radco Residential. what was the program? What is the program? Diversity, equity, and inclusion, social justice. What did you, uh, how did you get into that conversation? Give us some, give us like the foundation of where, how Radco put this together. Yeah, I guess, um, you know, for starters, uh, I know we're introducing us as diversity, equity, and inclusion and DEI approach Mm -hmm. or program, but um, I think for us, it's, uh, it's a little different. It's a little unconventional, right? Because uh, coming from an HR background, you know, DEI is typically textbook, you know, policies, procedures, boxes that you check Mm. to say that you did it. And, you know, you can tuck it away and say you did the right thing. Right. Um, And uh, for us, I think there was really this wake up call, um, you know, after the death of George Floyd, where we, uh, our COO had, a very personal conversation with someone on the leadership team. Um, uh, It was the Monday on our daily huddle right after the death of George Floyd. And uh, you could see on her face that it was weighing really heavy for her of what had had happened that weekend. Um, So he had approached her with the question of what can we do? You know, how are you doing? Um, And what, what do you think we can do as an organization and as a team? And uh, she was very, very open with him about what she was going through personally and also what the company could do a little bit differently to really start the conversation. So, you know, many companies, as you guys might remember, put out a lot of communications around that time. Internally, externally, it was, it was, it was definitely what was being done. And for us, we felt like, okay, if we're going to put words on paper, it needs to be more than words. We need to follow with action. So uh, our CEO, Norm, and Raid out put out a communication with a call to action to form a social justice committee. Um, we were so pleased with the turnout. We had a handful of team members who raised their hand, and it was a very diverse group, not just in terms of race, but also all levels of the company. So anywhere from C-suite to 
you know, maintenance technician, leasing consultants that got in a room together to talk about, you know, racism, to talk about inequity, to talk about all the things that were going on in the world at that time and continue to happen in, in our society. Um, and it was just such an impactful and emotional experience. We started meeting every week and speaking very openly about a topic that was um, just super taboo, right? We're not, we're taught to talk about these things. And uh, it was just a really, for us, that was kind of this moment of truth of this is going to be different um, for us as, as a company. I'm, I, I'm so fascinated. Sorry, Jonathan. I just have to ask this. So I love that you guys embrace this so quickly as an organization. And as I'm listening to you talk, I'm, I'm wondering, like you said, you know, it, it, it is taboo or it was taboo for us to have these types of conversations. Although when your employees walk away or they're by the water cooler, the kinds of things that they might say about the C-suite or the decision makers or feeling like they've been, you you know, pushed down uh, because of some type of, you know, racism, like you say, um, it, it's amazing that this is something that we've struggled with for so many years, right, in corporate America, but just in general. Um, so I am so excited that you guys have embraced this, that you've brought a team together of all levels, but how did you come up with the topics? Because again, the idea to sort of throw out some of these taboo subjects How'd you guys do that? That's what's fascinating me. Like who thought of the topics and who sparked the conversation? Because some of these can be uncomfortable for a lot of people. Yeah, so the conversation started with the social justice committee as an intimate group. I think we were roughly around 10 people or so um, at that time. And it was very organic, right? Just raw emotion around that time. Um, Meeting weekly, talking about the topic, uh, and really just listening. It, it's, you know, it's interesting, Mark. When you approach a conversation like that, that is so difficult to navigate because you're you're taught to kind of tiptoe around the topic and what can I say, what can I not say. Mm-hmm. When you approach it from a place of wanting to understand and wanting to listen, it changes the tone, uh, right? Uh, and also not trying to. Uh, pretend, you know, that, uh, that someone might not know what it's like, right. To, to walk in someone else's shoes. And so really just approaching it in a way of, you know, asking questions and listening. Um, and you know, if, if there's, there were moments there too, where it would get very emotional or someone would get really heightened, but we had to allow space for that because we can't expect our team members to show up at work every day and just hang their, feelings at the door. Um, and, you know, we really want people to bring their whole self to work. And how can you expect them to do that without allowing space for a conversation like that? Um, but for us, you know, this conversation that started with the social justice committee, uh, about two months into that is when we decided to open it up to the broader audience of the whole company. Um, we started meeting with consultants and they were talking about hosting a town hall but in our mind, how can, how can we have a town hall and have a COO stand in front of an audience and talk about our stands against racism when that CEO doesn't know what that's like, right? Um, so we said, you know what, our approach, let's take a chance and let's try to do this ourselves rather than having outside help. So we sent out a communication and uh, um, invited our team members to be part of the conversation with us as a committee. And um, that's when it really, that's when it really started. It was about 40 people in our first listening session in a virtual room, right? Because it was right in the middle of COVID. It was in July of 2020 um, for our first session. And uh, it was, it was very interesting. It it was kind of like an awkward first date, right? (laughs) For sure. It was this, no one really knew what to say, but we broke out into four, um, four breakout groups And so we made them smaller and intimate, more intimate. Um, And we just started with the question of why are you here? You know, what what compelled you to be here today and be part of the session? And uh, it was uh, extremely, extremely emotional, impactful. And it changes when it's no longer a news story or a social media post or 
or something you read on the news and it's your friend or your peer, uh, someone you respect, someone you've worked closely with and you realize this person lives life very differently than me just because of the color of their skin and never knew that. I've known this person for six years and I never knew that. Yeah. Um, the conversation changes when you come to that moment, that realization, right? And it's no longer something you read about. So I got a question for you, Janet, just from a, I, I was just trying to picture myself there in that, in that virtual room for that first time, the first time you had that in July and knowing that that's was the topic, you know, so what, can you describe what was that atmosphere like at that time? It, and what is it like now? And and a secondary question along with that, it sounds like this was more of a, as leaders, you were facilitating the conversation. Is that, is that true? Or was it taking the lead? Just I'd love to hear a little bit more about like what that experience was like, maybe on both sides of the table. Yeah, great, great questions. Um, so when we, the first session, we broke out into four, um, as I mentioned, four groups. And we, we really also saw this as, as an opportunity to uh, build future leaders in the organization. Um, Mike uh, Brewer, who's our COO, uh, he really feels strongly in empowering our team members and didn't really want the leadership team that sits in the committee to be facilitating these discussions. Um, and so really allowing space for our team members who may not typically be in that position to, to lead a group or lead a discussion to, to guide that. Um, and so that's, they were the facilitators of those four, but you know, the facilitation was more of just breaking the ice and navigating the conversation. It wasn't so much of, you know, let me talk and you listen, right? So it was very much of a group discussion in those rooms. The facilitator was there just more to, to kind of guide and navigate. Um, so we had our first listening session. We sent out a survey afterwards and the feedback was unanimous from all of our team members who attended. Um, everyone wanted another session. Um, and so we did, we hosted a second one about a month later and then a third about a month after that. So. Fast forward to September of 2020, we decided to approach that listening session a little bit differently. Um, so to your point uh, in your question about the topic and how to guide that, in that third session ahead of time, we sent out resources around the topic of racial profiling and unconscious bias. And that kind of stemmed from some of the conversation that took place in those first sessions where we, we could tell there was this root, we were kind of getting to the root of what's, why as a society, are we still talking about this? And are, is there still an issue, right? Why is it still an issue? And so we, we found that racial profiling kept coming up and unconscious bias kept coming up. So we found some really great resources that we sent out to our team, um, team members ahead of time. And that became kind of the focus of our third session. And you could tell the conversation got deeper at that point because mm -hmm. One, there was a little more structure. And then two, we broke the ice a little, right? It, people started getting more comfortable. Um, but what was really interesting and great about that last session uh, was that we started shifting from conversation to action. Uh, at the end of that, at the end of that session, we spent about 15 minutes, 20 minutes talking about now what can we do? As people, as individuals, as a company, what can we do? And the ideas just started flowing and we started a list. And from that list is where we formed subcommittees uh, from our social justice subcommittees to start taking action. And uh, it was really great to see that our team members were part of that solution, right? Going back to your original question about DEI, where it's typically top-down approach, you know, HR behind closed doors, checking boxes, sending everything out, here's what we're gonna do this whole journey we went through, it was, it was more of just everyone together being part of the solution, telling the company what we could do and us listening. And so uh, that was really, that was really great. And it's great to, I think for our team members who were part of that to start seeing those things in motion 
of, wow, I was, I'm, I'm part of that solution, right? I was, I, I identified that as an issue and now the company is taking action. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you mind me asking what types of actions do you see happening when you say actions? I think now that you've uncovered these incredible topics, these raw feelings from your employees. So now what, what will be done next to ensure that people feel different? You know, like what are some of those? Because I'm, I'm so fascinated to, to see how it all kind of comes together in the end. And in the end, I mean, just that there is now the next step to roll out a behavior because this will never end, right? It will be a constantly changing and involving uh, and evolving um, thing that we deal with, um, which I think is wonderful because our world is changing every day, right? And so what, what now? Like, what do you guys do to make your employees feel the change? Yeah. um, So good question. The, the, uh, subcommittees that we formed at the end of that third session. So we invited our team members who wants to be part of this, you know, you've helped identify action items who wants to be part of the work. And so we formed four subcommittees and team members, you know, raised their hand to be part of that. Since the fall of 2020, those subcommittees have been meeting biweekly every other week working on what all the ideas that they want to come up with. Um, The company's promise has been we will support what the committee wants to do from a financial aspect as well as resources. Um, And so to answer your question, the subcommittees, the first one was celebrating diversity. Um, We really felt that, uh, you know, even taking a look at the holidays that a company typically recognizes to, you know, people, it, there, there's a lot that gets left out in between. So in the celebrating diversity, we really put a strong emphasis on communicating to the company to highlight and celebrate different, you know, special days and holidays and uh, people that part of history um, and allowing our team members to be part and sharing stories of what those days mean to them or what, you know, the, the month means to them. Um, and so really celebrating that and highlighting that. So that's one subcommittee that meets and continues those commu- that communication cadence ongoing. Um, another subcommittee that was formed is recruiting. And through that, we are establishing partnerships with HBCUs. So um, historically black um, colleges and universities. And so th- through those partnerships, looking at different recruiting opportunities, Um, Also, starting the race dialogue with some of the local universities in Georgia. Um, So, you know, what what, what the conversation looks like at the university and how can we be a part of it. Uh, We're also revisiting our job descriptions um, and our educational requirements to make sure that they're not adversely affecting minority groups. Um, And also looking at our marketing material and our website and the language that we use. Are we being inclusive and you know, are we reflecting diversity, right, in our images and in our marketing and in everything that we um, put out to the world and that we use for recruiting purposes as well. Um, the third subcommittee is uh, supporting minority-owned businesses, and they are in the process right now of creating a platform to highlight and support local minority-owned businesses in our community. And so, they're still kind of working on that. And it's been great to see because uh, a few of the committee members actually have uh, a small business or a side business of their own. And so it's been great for them as business owners to also be part of that work. Um, And then the fourth subcommittee is community outreach. Um, And so really looking at nonprofits that help underserved communities, providing financial resources or education, um, so really just trying to tap into different opportunities in the nonprofit world um, and outreach in our, um, you know, in our local communities, as well as in the broader sense as well. Wow. It sounds like you guys know exactly <laughs> what you're doing. I love it. I, I, really- you have mapped this whole thing out. And what I love is that you have 
executed it. You know, you're you're living the words that you guys are all putting on paper, and that impresses me greatly. So kudos to you guys over there at Radco for stepping forward and wanting to make a difference. And um, I, I'm I'm very impressed. Jonathan, it looks like you had something you wanted to say. Sorry if I cut you off. I get I got excited. <laughs> no, no, no. You 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 spoke it eloquently, my friend. Like it's just, it's I'm astounded. I'm amazed. Like there's no words to describe this. I, you know, from a PR perspective, I I watch where businesses and brands like like face plant, totally face planted on this on this issue. And it was buy my spark plugs, hashtag inclusion inclusion and diversity or or something along that line. And had there was no substance to it whatsoever. They were taking advantage of a social challenge that was going on to promote their stuff. And boy, were they ever called out for it. And here we're listening to you, Janet, and listening to the Radco residential brand and what you've done as leaders and as a company. And it's the polar opposite. It's the like the, the full you are all in. Like we're not just going to have a poster that says, recognize that there's inequality. Thank you for looking at my poster. Like it's just so, so, so much depth to it. And I, I'm, I'm speechless. Um, well, I guess I appreciate I'm that, you know, it, but it brings to mind it, um, you know, I, I appreciate everything you guys are saying and, and, and I do, I, I think the Radico has done a great job as a team to not just put words on paper and kind of put in the work. There's so much work still to be done, right? It's like just the beginning. This is, this is long-term and we made that very clear. This is, this is a marathon, right? We are, this isn't something that has a end and we can say, oh, we did our part, you know, this, um, as we see, there's still a lot of recent events that can be very discouraging because yeah. as the meet, we're like, gosh, you know, you know, what are we really, are we really going to make a difference? You know, and, and you get these moments of, you know, self-doubt and, and then there's this, these raw moments of vulnerability where we have these conversations, allow space for that. And you can see it. Everyone's like, wow, at the end of the hour, that's what I needed. We needed to talk about this and thank you for listening, you know? And mm -hmm. I think what comes to mind to me is uh, just bringing back the human aspects of this, right? As a company, right? We're, we don't even call it diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? I, I know I told you to put that as kind of the title because I think people relate to that. But honestly, we, we haven't even refer to it as that internally, because to us, this is just, this is just work that we're doing because it's important. And it's about our, it's about people and, and real issues and in the world. And we can't go about business just pretending it's not happening. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I do, I think, I think Radco has just done a, a tremendous job of um, supporting our team members and being part and courageous in the conversation. Um, but, you know, there's, there's still so much, so much work to do and so much, and, and the most important, I think for me is really continuing the conversation, um, mm -hmm. continuing the conversation and knowing that this isn't, you know, just because we maybe stop hearing about it in the news for a few months, doesn't mean it's gone away. That's right. Cause I think in, in our society and in today's world, that's what, that's what we're kind of programmed feel right if if it's not out there and in our face and we're not seeing it in social media out of sight out of mind and i think that's been the biggest thing for us is no this this is still going on and this yeah. is gonna unfortunately continue and and we need that our work needs to continue along with that too Right. Well, and I think you bring up such a valuable point about keeping this going because uh, as you were talking, I'm I'm imagining you are you are exposing a very raw, vulnerable topic that we all should be talking about, right? Everywhere in our industry, especially because we are in housing, we are around people every day. But what I also see you doing by by allowing these committees to live and to have open of candor conversations. Um, to me, it would be changing your company culture. Your employees would be 
they they should feel happier knowing that this is the kind of culture that our C-suite believes in, that our company stands for. And so, like you said, this is a this is a long term commitment. And um, I think the the benefits that you guys will see from it are are not only just um, of of human nature, but the commitment from your employees, because I'll tell you, I think that company culture is so crucial right now. And when they believe or when they they can know that they believe in something, that they're working for a company that believes in them, everyone's going to be so much more happier and more productive. So, I mean, yeah, you're right. This is a long-term solution to a terrible issue. And, um, but the benefits that I hope you guys will see will follow your, your path for a very long time. For sure. Yeah, I I agree with you hundred percent, Mark. I think, um, I think when a team members or just people, right. In general, realize that someone cares about them as a person and not just for their output or, Mm -hmm. right or performance or whatever it may be, right? In the workplace where we work, we're rewarded for our work and uh, we check in and everything's kind of, you know, we're, we're very professional and we, we keep it at that level. And I think when you start caring about people as people uh, and a whole and their whole self, right? Their personal life as well included, um, it, it does, it, ch- it changes things. It changes the, the, the trust, uh, it changes um, the connection, mm-hmm. um, not just from leadership to team member, but peer to peer. Yeah. Um, and to your point, uh, people are more productive, they're more engaged, they're more, um, they're, they're prouder to stay in the company and work on behalf of a company that cares about them as a person. And you know, that, that they know that, hey, if, if I'm having a bad day because of something that's personal to me, the company cares about that and they're not, you know, and so it does, it changes the way that we, um, that we interact with one another and the way we communicate. And uh, it, it is, it's, it's a win-win in, in so many different ways. Um, and I'm proud to be a part of it. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, on behalf of Mark and I, Janet, and on behalf of our audience, like just a heartfelt, huge thank you for, for bringing this uh, discussion to, to our show today. I, I'm confident, you know, I know Mark is too, that any who listening today or uh, at any time to this show will, they need to take this back to their leaders take the show back and give it a listen, give it a watch, do it again. Uh, we're grateful t- to you and to Radco for, for taking the lead. And uh, we know there's a lot of companies that are out there that are doing their best to try and sort this out, but we're grateful for you really to the transparency and being able to showcase the steps that you've gone through as a company and will continue to go through in order to uh, address social justice on an ongoing basis. So thank you very much. Thank you guys again for having me. And um, I also want to just mention to anyone who's listening, um, you know, for me, I think the biggest motivator of being part of this conversation is to hopefully inspire others to kind of take this step and having a courageous conversation. And it, and it might look completely different for the other company or the other person, right? Because you have to do what's right for, for your company. But I do think taking that step is really important. So I do want to um, just mention that if anyone has any questions or uh, is thinking about implementing, you know, wants to brainstorm, ask me any questions that they can reach out to me directly as well. Um, I think you said you would be sharing my email address, but it's uh, my first initial last name at radco.us. So jbalden at radco.us. Um, so if every, anybody has any questions, I'm happy to um, talk through it. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I appreciate that. We'll definitely get that in the show notes and we want people to reach out to you and we we'll look forward to some social conversation about this also. So before we close the show out, again, thank you, Janet, and uh, thank you to your team. Please pass that on from Mark and I in the audience. Yeah. 
and yes. pass that on to them. We appreciate everyone on your team, what, they, what they've done. And uh, we're grateful for that. Uh, do you have, again, whether it's related to social justice, just we know you've been an educator for many, many years. Do you have a, either a mantra or a go-to tip that you as an educator would be willing to share with the audience today? Anything along that line? Um, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to steal it from uh, our COO, Mike Brewer, and, and he said it best, and, and I, I only share it because I, I truly believe in it, um, but we are really creating a culture where if, uh, if we invest in our people and we take care of our people, then they in turn will take care of the business, right? And so our people, our team members are first always, and um, you know, course our, our residents are extremely important to us and that's our the you know our business mm -hmm. um team members are the ones that are taking care of our residents and of the organization and they're on the front lines every day um and making it happen and so for us it's it's extremely important uh team member for wonderful thank you of the business so yeah. yeah, that's great. Awesome. <laughs> I love that. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Yeah, thank you so much. Well, we'll definitely make sure people connect with you. So thank you for sharing your your email, uh, Mark. Yeah. How can we? How can people connect with you? Absolutely. Yes, you can reach me at uh, howlcreativeconcepts.com, which Howl is spelled H-O-W-L, like Howl at the moon, um, or Mark at howlcreativeconcepts.com is my email address. I, I love this topic, Janet. I will be following back up with you to see how things are going for you guys. I, I know without a shadow of a doubt with everything that you've accomplished already that we're going to see some really great things um, from, from you all over there at Radco in the future. So again, thank you so much for being a thank part you. of our show. And, and Mark, yeah. I also want to mention, you know, um, you know, I mentioned my email address, but if anyone also has radicoresidential.com that they can visit our website um, if they have any questions in general. Um, and to your point, Mark, I know we, we have go way back. Um, so thank you so much for having me. Radica Residential, I don't know if you've heard, we just officially launched our third party platform. Um, so providing our property management services to owners um, and investors. And uh, so we're very excited about the opportunity to kind of expand into that space and uh, taking what we do best and kind of sharing it with, uh, with others. Um, so I'm very excited about that and I'm excited to be part of that journey. Nice. Awesome. That's great. Well, we will <laughs> definitely be having you back on the show too. We've had Mike on before. I know we'll have <laughs> yeah. him on uh, at some point in the future, but we do greatly appreciate you bringing your, your impact, your leadership, your experience to the table today. And yeah, we look forward to doing a follow-up on this show. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we'll check in, in in a few months and I'm happy to kind of share some more of our journey as we kind of keep going forward. Perfect. Right. Perfect. Perfect. Thank Very you good. guys so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, that's been episode 27. Bye, we look forward to seeing everyone on our next show. My name is Jonathan Saar. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.